like you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of James, chapter 2, verse 14. Faith without works is dead. I want to speak to you not about faith without works, but faith with works, because only faith with works works. Verse 14, James 2, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to him, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things you are, which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Faith works. People who have faith are blessed. Believers in God are often, not always, but often healthier, happier, more at peace with themselves and the world around them, more motivated, more successful in life than many others. One of the chief reasons for this is that faith gives you a sense of direction and purpose. It's not a self-invented purpose of life, a way of looking at life which is based on your own personal view and understanding. The sense of direction and purpose is like a compass that is set to true north, the real north of who God is, the ultimate reality, the person who gives us a sense of destiny. And with that carries also with it a sense of responsibility to society and concern for others. And especially Christian believers who seek to model their lives on the person of Jesus Christ, we are taught to walk the walk of faith based on love to God and love to our neighbor. Faith really does work. How many people of faith do we have here? Let's see your hands. No, oh, there's a few doubters, a few unbelieving believers. How many people here are men and women of faith? Let's see your hands. Congratulations. You've proved that faith works. If you know that, say an amen. amen. But what is faith? At its simplest, without getting complicated, and we don't need to complicate it, faith is simply believing God and acting on His Word. Many people say they believe, but without acting on God's word, that faith doesn't run its fullest course, doesn't come to completion, doesn't come to fruition, and is certainly of no use when it comes to helping other people, which is the point of the passage that I just read from James chapter 2. Real faith, faith that is applied and put into practice, real practical working faith achieves amazing things. We were reading just a moment before I began to preach about this man, Miles, Miles Hilton Barber, a man who was blind but has achieved more as a blind person than many, many people who have all of their physical faculties and senses at work. And the message of his life is that you can do it. The only thing that limits you is your own mindset. And what faith does is hook you up with God's mindset for your life. We know whenever we speak about faith, a lot of people will agree with us. Many people out there in the world will agree with us and say, yes, it's wonderful. Even atheists say, you know, I admire the fact that you believe. Some even say, I wish I could believe like you. But of course, I'm more sensible than you are because I know that God doesn't exist. And so the idea is, is that people of faith are supposedly a bit soft in the head. They've been indoctrinated by their parents or whoever, by society, somehow to fear the existence of God and uh, 
therefore keep their lives in check as if it's some kind of moral thing that, you know, it's better to believe in God because then you've got some sense of accountability. Many atheists would argue against that strongly and say, no, that's exactly what's the problem with our society is that people have been taught to believe in God as the basis of morality and of honorable living. And then when they discover there is no God, like every sensible person does, then they say there's no basis for morality. And whole books are based by atheists are written based on the idea that you can have a morality without God. And I guess that's true, but you cannot have an absolute morality. You can have a morality that you construct out of your own good ideas, but a, a man and a woman whose life is lined up with God is lined up with ultimate reality and that which makes this universe work. When we are walking in faith, we are walking in line with the ultimate reality who is God himself and Jesus, whom he sent into this world. And so life makes more sense than anything else. One very famous Christian apologist said, I believe in the sun not because I can look at it, but because by the light of the sun I see everything else. Our understanding of God enlightens our understanding of life, and we can chart a course guided by the Holy Spirit, a life of faith that will take us from glory to glory, from triumph to triumph. Even in the midst of tragedy, we can rejoice and celebrate because we know our faith is anchored in something very sure. And that ultimately is God's Word. Faith is something that is linked totally to what God says. It's not our own invention, but when we are linked with God's plan and God's purpose for our lives, we discover that any dream won't do. My dream is not good enough. My parents' dream for me is not good enough. Society's dream for me isn't good enough, but only God's dream is good enough. This month I'm celebrating my 60th birthday, and I wrote a little thank you to all of you in the opening page of the Revival Times. And one of the things that I said about that is that I'm astonished and amazed and ever so grateful that God had a dream for my life. And that dream was far bigger and better than any puny little ambitious dream that I might have had for myself. Because only in God's dream do I discover who I really am and what I'm capable of in God. And that brings real meaning, satisfaction in the good times and hope in the desperate times because God is always with us. How does faith work? It works from God's Word like a seed faith, God speaking a seed word into our lives that ultimately brings forth fruit. And it's the fruit of faith that becomes very visible. Uh, Miles, we listed some of the things that he's done and he doesn't do anything by halves, diving with great white sharks as a, as a person who's circumnavigated the world, 80 different methods of transport, 38,000 miles. And as a person who is blind, it's astonishing what he's achieved. And he's done it because God has spoken to him. I'll tell you what, I've not heard from God that I should go diving with great white sharks. I'm a diver, but sharks one way, me the other way. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I'm not about to jump in and do everything that Miles has done because God hasn't told me to do those things, thankfully. Uh, maybe he's told me to do other things, and God maybe hasn't told you to do those things, but he's told you to do other things. You do what God tells you to do. I do what God tells me to do, and together we bring glory to God because the works of faith magnify his name. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, as I think I've alluded to, is the fact that it's a great record of faith's hall of, of honor. And look at some of the things that they achieved. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain. Cain offered the fruit of the ground, vegetables, but Abel saw beyond that and said, God requires a blood sacrifice. Now, that was, takes a lot of faith at that time. And he understood the principle. And so from way back there in the early chapters of Genesis till today, thousands and thousands of years later, we're still talking about that act. Because we know that it pointed to the fact that Jesus Christ became the Lamb of God and shed his blood for the redemption of the world. And it still takes faith to believe that today. It's one of the things that irritates 
non-believers and even liberal Christians and liberal theologians about Bible-believing faith. That it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. That somehow 2,000 years ago, when the Lamb of God shed His blood on the cross, He did it as a substitute sacrifice. The sinless one was made sin offering that we, sinful, may be made righteous in the presence of God. That takes faith. And Abel had it. Noah built an ark and said, there's a flood coming. Nobody had even seen rain. He built it in the middle of the desert, and they said, you're crazy. He said, wait till the rains come. You'll see who's crazy. It took faith to do that. Abraham left Ur, not knowing where he was going. He was led and guided by the Holy Spirit. Sarah, his wife, conceived and bore a child, though she had been barren all her life, and by now was well past it in terms of childbearing. The son that was born, Isaac, was in everything but the actual final act offered as a sacrifice to God by Abraham in obedience to the word of God. And he said, it doesn't make sense. God is not looking for human sacrifice. Nowhere does it ever say that God would ever be interested in such a thing. But to test Abraham, God said, sacrifice your son, your only son, the one in whom is the promise for the salvation of the world. And Abraham said, I believe you, and I'm going to do it, but it's your problem, God. It's your problem. If I kill him, you're going to have to raise him from the dead. And that's exactly what happened in, in, you know, in, in, in picture language because in the final moment, God said, don't do it, and held his, hand, uh, held his hand back, and God provided a lamb for himself. He provided a sacrifice. And that sacrifice was substituted for Isaac, just like Jesus was substituted for us. And uh, Abraham said, we're going to go up and worship, and we're going to come back again. So if I kill him, God, you're going to raise him up from the dead because I'm coming back with the promise. And sometimes the very thing which we believe we've got to hold on to the most because it's God's promise, God's plan, God's will, and it can become an idol. We can love God's promises more than God himself. And he says, lay it all down and watch me. I'll raise it up again and give it back to you in a way you'd never possibly understand. Is God speaking to somebody here today? Joseph spoke about the future of ex- the future exodus and gave instructions for his bones to be taken from Egypt back to the promised land. This was years, many years before it happened. Joseph said, I'm going to die. The time is going to come when you guys are going to go back home, but take me with you. Take my bones with you. He spoke in faith. Amazing, amazing faith. Moses' parents hid him. Not just because he was a lovely baby. You can look at a baby, a newborn baby, and please, if it ever happens to you, always smile and say how beautiful the baby looks. Because a baby is beautiful in the eyes of the beholder. Sometimes I've looked at babies and I think, my goodness me, you're an ugly child. (laughs) And thank God, out of ugliness, some beautiful things come. Amen. All right, let's not go there. So we smile and say, look how beautiful. And they said, what a beautiful baby. But it was more than that. By faith, they hid him so he would not be killed, as was Pharaoh's edict. And then later on, when Moses grew up, by faith, he refused to be identified with the Egyptians. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he chose, rather, to suffer affliction with the people of God. Now, that takes faith. We want the feel-good factor in our Christianity. If it feels good, bless us. We'll take it. But Jesus speaks about discipleship, which doesn't feel so comfortable. We have to feel the nails going through our hands, nailing us to the cross that we are called to carry in the name of Jesus to follow in his footsteps. Don't say amen, say ouch. But we are prepared to suffer affliction rather than compromise. Oh, okay. Let's pretend I never said that. Let's try it again so you'll be more ready this time. We are ready to suffer rather than compromise. Amen. Amen. We're coming around. We're coming around. It takes faith to say that and mean it. And even greater faith to live it out. I know that. But it's the stuff and substance of this supernatural lifestyle God has given to us. 
By faith, Moses kept the Passover and left Egypt. Israelites passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Kingdoms were conquered by faith. Promises were obtained by faith. Lions' mouths were shut by faith. Are there any growling lions in your life? May God shut their mouths. Oh, you're happy with that one. Amen. Amen. (laughs) <laughs> I can think of a few mouths. Never mind. Okay. F- f- by faith, flames were quenched in the fiery furnace. He didn't touch them. People escaped death by the sword, deliverance. Weakness was turned to strength by faith. People became brave and effective in battle by faith. Armies were routed, dead were raised. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen and amen. Now then, we can see the author to the Hebrews is flying high. He's soaring like an eagle, and he ain't coming down yet. But listen to what he goes on to say. See if we can equally say amen to some of these other great exploits of faith. So far, we've seen victory and deliverance and power and promises and blessing. And now he goes on without taking a breath. By faith, the dead were raised. By faith, tortures were endured. By faith, people accepted mockings, beatings, and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn in half, and slaughtered. They were destituted, just destitute, afflicted and tormented. They wandered in deserts and across mountains and lived in caves by faith. One amen. God bless you. Sister, I don't know what's going on in your life, but if you can identify with that, then that amen is heard in heaven. And what is this about? Why is it that in one instance there's a deliverance, people rescued from the sword. In another instance, Jesus says, God says, go through it. Go to prison, you're going to die. What's the difference? You see, when we walk by faith, we respond to what God is saying to us. How God is going to be glorified in our lives. And nothing is wasted when we walk by faith. I'll come back to this story a little later on in my message. But very recently, I revisited a place just outside of Marseille, uh, on a little island called Chateau d'If. Um, the, this is where the story of the Count of Monte Cristo is set. That story is a fictional story, uh, but it, the place is real. It was a fort, and then it became a prison. And uh, this prison was used at one stage to, to lock away all the dissidents, people who were even out of favor, out of political favor, as well as uh, scallywags and, and vagabonds. But I, when I was there, I noticed something for the first time. There's a little plaque up there saying, in, in, this, in this deathly pr- prison, it's really quite chilling, and uh, written on the, on there, the wall was a little uh, tribute to 3,000 500 Protestant believers who gave their lives for the gospel between 1500 and 1700. Many of them were incarcerated in Chateau d'If. Others were kept in a fort on the mainland. They lost their lives. They died in prison. They died of sickness, illness, malnutrition, starvation. They were beaten and afflicted. And those that survived were then taken to the guillotine and killed. No wonder God has sent us to Marseille. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Amen. In other words, God is, their blood is not wasted. God chose for them a path that they would not have chosen for themselves. But in other words, we respond to God's word specifically to our lives. We can call this the Rhema word of God. It's God's word to us specifically. Have a look in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17. It says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In this context, it's talking about the word of faith, the gospel. The gospel must be heard and believed. It needs to be heard in order to be believed. And it needs to be preached in order to be heard. So if we really believe that we want to see our friends and neighbors saved, we have to preach to them the word of faith, the word of life. 
It's no good just praying for them to be saved. Tell them about Jesus. But the principle underlying this is a principle that applies to every single part of our lives. Not just when we first hear the gospel and believe and get saved, but when we hear every other promise of God from the scriptures. We hear that word, and the word here is rhema in the Greek. There's other words which use logos, but this rhema is God's published word, God's spoken words, God's word proclaimed into our lives, the word by which we live by faith every day of our lives. When Jesus was tempted by the enemy and to make those stones bread after 40 days of fasting, Jesus said, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone. But every word that proceeds, present tense, that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that's the word rhema. In other words, every day of your life, God has a word for you. Just as the Israelites reach out of their tent every morning, fresh were the manna from heaven, so you and I every day receive a fresh word from God for that day. And it's amazing how that's how we live. A walk of faith, a life of faith is feeding on the faith words of God. And that faith operates powerfully and dynamically when we receive that word by faith. And it's a specific word into our lives. And the first change it brings is a change to the way we talk. Back in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Again, I tell you, the context of this is hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And maybe today you're hearing the gospel for the first time. Do you know the gospel calls for a response? For you to believe the word of the gospel? To believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? To believe that Jesus Christ took your place on the cross? That he was crucified, carried your sins, and yet on the third day God raised him from the dead? And if we believe in him, put our trust in him, we shall not perish. We'll have everlasting life. We shall be saved. But it causes, calls for a response from you to say, I receive that word, I believe that word, and I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. That's the context of this passage. Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So you see, belief in your heart, the first fruit of that is the declaration of your mouth. If you've received Christ as Savior, you confess Him as Savior and as Lord. So the first fruit of faith, the first way that faith operates is by changing the way we talk and listening to some believers. I wonder if they are not make-believers what comes out of their mouth. I'm not talking about having some kind of name it, claim it, blab it, grab it kind of attitude to life. How are you? I'm best and highly flavored. Do you mean blessed and highly favored? Yes, I do. Best and highly flavored, blessed and highly favored, however you put it. And that's good to be able to say that. But if it's just somebody who is hiding behind a veil of super spirituality and you can't get through that veil and talk to the people as they really are. I know you're blessed and highly favored, so am I. But how are you really? Oh yes, I may be blessed and highly favored, but I'm feeling miserable. Okay, now let's talk about that. I'm not talking about walking around pretending and just spiritual talk, especially the Sunday talk. How are you? Well, praise God in heaven most high. I'm wonderful. And, uh, yeah, and your wife says, that's not what you were saying to me a moment ago. <laughs> but there is a real way in which when faith grips your heart, it overflows through your mouth. Out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks That's what the Bible says. Jesus has this picture of tree and fruit when he talks about the life of faith. Matthew 12, verse 33 says, Either make the tree good, and its fruit will be good, or else make the tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. And the first fruit out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is real faith confession. Learning how to let our faith rule our tongue. 
And that's the first sign that something deep has happened in your life, that you've, there's a change that has taken place. So we receive and believe, and we begin to speak differently. If you really believe a promise from God, not only will your thinking and attitude change, but you, will, you can't help yourself speaking words of faith. Not positive thinking, not just positive confession. Any New Age follower can do that. I'm talking about really lining up your heart, your soul, your mind, your thinking, your purpose, your ambition, your zeal, your passion with the purposes of God and marrying that to the promises of God and living in the Word of God in such a way as the Word of God begins to live in you. That seed faith is sown deep in your spirit and you begin to water it with the water of the Spirit, with prayer, with intercession, with exercising your faith and beginning to speak words of faith and strength and action. But it's not enough just to learn how to speak good. If you go back to James chapter 2, we begin to now see what James is talking about. James is a very practical teacher. He says, I hear all you people, you speak well. You say all kinds of amazing things. God bless you. Peace be upon you. It's amazing. He says, the other day, when I was in your assembly, I saw somebody come in, and they had no clothes. They were very poor, wearing rags. It was freezing cold outside. They hadn't eaten for days. And one of you stood up and gave them a word of faith. Well, God bless your word of faith. Your faith was, peace be upon you. May God bless you, fill your stomach, and keep you warm. Amen. And he said, what good is that? Can that save that guy? Can that help that guy? The word save there is not about salvation from sin. It's talking about practical help. And he says, if you really want to know, that kind of faith is barren and fruitless. It is of no use. Especially to the person you're praying over. And especially if you've got a fat wallet somewhere in your coat, and all you need to do is pull out a 10-pound note or more, and say, God bless you. Go with this and be filled. Go with this and be warmed. Little children, do not love only in word, but love in deed and truth. And what an amazing transformation that would bring. This is 21st century Christianity. Come on, people of God. We need something real. They want to see our fruit. They want to taste our fruit. A fruit tree doesn't exist for itself. A fruit tree bears fruit so others can come and say, mm, thank you, I don't mind if I do, help myself. And when they see the fruit and taste the fruit, they begin to glorify Father in heaven. I'll come back to that verse because this story won't go out of my mind. It's a true story. Win Lewis, senior minister here, I su succeeded him and he went to be with Jesus a few years ago. He was a very witty man, and uh, he had often complain as to how the, the poverty spirit, the mentality amongst church leaders, especially elders and deacons in British churches. One day, Wynne had traveled across the whole country from one side to the other. Uh, I don't know how many tanks of petrol that took. He got there, preached his heart out, and at the end, the deacon at the door said, Oh, Pastor Lewis, goodbye. God bless you. And when paused for a moment, because now's the time, he said he'd at least get his expenses. And Wynne wasn't after money. So he went, walked out, then he said, no, I turned around, and he says, excuse me. Tapped the deacon on the shoulder. Oh, yes, yes. Tell me, uh, which petrol station can I use that voucher you just gave me? <laughs> what voucher was that? Oh, the God bless you voucher. Where can I redeem that voucher? It sounds so impressive, but I need to redeem it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that's ridiculous, isn't it? And it's the same when the men and women of the world hear us say, Oh, God bless you. God loves you. And they look at you, and you ain't loving. <laughs> you is mean. Hmm? Or if you, if you pretend to care and don't actually practically care, don't actually practically do anything, what good is it? 
In my say this week, I heard a testimony of a, a lady. She was giving a testimony in the church meeting. And uh, she said, you know, she had a, an amazing breakthrough with her neighbors. And the whole story is her neighbors were neighbors from hell. You, have you, you got them as well? All right. Neighbors from hell start to do DIY at midnight. Bang, 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 bang. And uh, so then they start to chop down all the trees and, and leaves are going everywhere, branches are everywhere, flying around. They leave it around for days. So she says, God, I want you to bless them with a brick, a brick bat from heaven. <laughs> I want to knock these neighbors from hell wet back to where they belong. <laughs> but the grace of God prevailed. And she went across to the neighbors with a big rubbish bag, and she said, oh, may I help you? And they looked at her, and they said, oh, no, it's, it's okay, thank you. But it was very nice of you to offer. Wow. Small thing. Small thing. But most of us just sit and complain, not to think, what can we do? which is of practical use to share Christ. And that sounds like a trivial thing. It's not trivial, especially when we know how much of the flesh has to be crucified even to do something like that. And really, this life of faith works in day-to-day -day real situations. Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 6. You'll probably find it up there quickly, quicker than I can find it. I'm talking about... I'm sorry, I, I lost my place here. Never mind. I can quote it for you anyway. Let your light so shine before men. I think it's Matthew 6, 17. Find it for me on the screen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what it's about. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Because the world understands this. Back to Chateau d'If. Last time I was here, I told you about over the summer, I spent a lot of time mixing with people in the terraces, coffee, the bars in the outs, out there in, in, in France, they have this terrace culture, so they have coffee, cafe, talk, chat, and I met a lot of people and got to know a lot of people, particularly young people, and one of these young guys is an atheist, very strong, robust atheist, 22 years of age, he knows everything, see, really strong, you know everything at 22. And uh, anyway, he heard I was back in Marseille, so he, he traveled right across France just to come and spend a couple of days with me. It's amazing. You saying something to me down here? Did you find that? What is it? Matthew 5, 16. Got it. Thank you. Just find it and put it up so that people can read it while I'm talking, because I'm still on that topic. And so I said, okay, all right. You haven't seen any of the sites. I'll show you. Let's go and have a look at Chateau d'If. And uh, as he walked around there, looked into all these places, and he got very quiet. And uh, so I let him, you know, it's always good sometimes as Christians to know when to shut up, let the Holy Spirit work. At the end of this tour, he said, you know, I can't believe how cruel people can be. Hearing about the cruel tortures. This is a barbaric age, of course. Cruel world. Man's inhumanity to man. And he was deeply troubled. Then he said, you know, I think there can be no better thing in life, no greater purpose than finding ways to help your fellow man to be nice to be loving. I said, almost talking like a Christian now, because Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
and love your neighbor as yourself. We who say we love God and don't do the other side, we, we have got this vertical hotline to God. You know, I'm a very patient person, except when it comes to people who've got this vertical thing to God and think that's all that counts. You want to bring a word of correction? Oh, Jesus is my pastor. He told me what to do, not you. Well, I love God, but you, and they start to curse their fellow person. They won't reconcile. They won't be nice. They won't care. They don't participate in any community. No, di no horizontal dimension. That's not real love. Real love comes from heaven, and it touches other people. Real faith works. And so when people see what you do, they will glorify God. They will vindicate you. They will say, your faith is real. They will glorify your Father in heaven. Show them by what you do that you really believe. That's why faith without works is dead. It's fruitless. It's unproductive. It is of no use. So James says that kind of faith is fruitless, useless. The word he uses is a strong word, dead it cannot, it doesn't go anywhere. But oh, how our world needs to see what we believe. Um, believe me, they're watching us. They don't listen too much to what you say. They've heard it all before. They look at what you, what you do and how you act, what it's like under stress what it's like when you're criticized and rebuked, what it's like, what you are like when problems come your way, what you are like with, when people who mistreat you, they look at that and they say, ah, oh, he calls himself a Christian. Now, we're not in bondage with this because thank God we are saved by faith and faith alone. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 make it very clear. For by grace we have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's a gift of God, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on, having talked about being saved freely by, by grace through faith. All we have to do is believe. Genuinely believe, put our trust in Christ, and our destiny is settled forever. Hallelujah. Not by works. No one can boast. And yet, though we are not saved by good works, we are saved for good works. And Paul goes on to say, Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. Oh, beautiful. The word here is where we get the English word poem from. It means a craft, the work of a master craftsman. A poet is a wordsmith. But it's not just in terms of poetry, but all forms of craftsmanship, workmanship. So God has beautifully created us in Christ. So that's the second creation. The first creation is our physical life. Second creation is who we are in Christ. So we could say that God has worked and fashioned us and remade us in Christ for a purpose. To do good works. In other words, God has prepared something for us which is totally bespoke and custom tailor-made to who we are. Amen. And prepared us for that very thing, which means we'll never be comfortable with life, let alone fulfilled with life, until we discover the rhema word from God concerning who we are in Christ and what he's called us to do. Now, we can say, as we do very often, what that is in general terms. We are called to love God 
and to become like Jesus and to go to heaven bringing as many people with us. Go and make disciples of all nations. Our whole church structure is built around the cell model by which you and I in small groups can learn to do this with intention, with purpose, helping one another, ministering to one another, caring for one another, and reaching out to the lost together in community, loving God and loving one another. Hallelujah. That's church. That's general. But you and I are called with specific ways. It might be that you have certain gifts that I do not have. It might be that I have a ministry and a calling and gifts that you do not have. I do it the way God has given it to me to do, and you do what God has called you to do. You know, I envy many of you, not with a godless envy, but you know, you go to places they won't let me to go. You get to talk to people who wouldn't talk to me. Some of you go to the high and mighty, some of you go to the low and mighty. Where you go, you are a witness for Christ, and you are to influence for Christ. And I said to a young man this week, who turned 19 years of age, and a student in our school in Marseille, and he says, I don't want to miss God. I said, you won't miss God if you do two things. He said, what's that? First of all, I said, discover who you are. And then number two, act accordingly. Who you are in Christ, he's made you. Who you are in Christ, you are special. You say, what about all the mess and the sin and the junk? I know about that. Enough in my life as well. I'm not talking about your stuff. I'm talking about my stuff. I've got to get my stuff sorted out. But the truth is, is that we see ourselves in Christ and we are being shaped daily to be more and more like him, to become more and more who we are and then to act accordingly. And when you do that, there is a divine fingerprint, a divine DNA of God in you which is exceptional to you and nobody else but you. And then when you live like that, you live distinct Leave behind distinct impressions of who you are in God that not even the devil can wipe away. Même lui ne peut pas s'effacer tout ce que Dieu veut faire à travers de toi. Did anybody understand that? Yes. Nobody understood it. Where's the French speaker? Did you understand that? Stand up and shout what I said. Come on, translate for me. Shout to everybody what I said. Oh, no, she wants me to repeat it. I don't know I can repeat it. I said it by inspiration. I will translate it. Okay, you, you will. we'll talk later because you can help me. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm frightened to repeat it in case I got it wrong. I just said in French what I just previously said in English. Not even the devil can wipe away the things that God wants to do and can do through you. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen and amen. So the faith that works is not just the faith that brings good fruit and good stuff in our life. The faith that works is the faith that op offers those fruits to the people around us. So they can taste through us and see that the Lord is good. Amen, amen, amen. Give Jesus a mighty praise. Come back to the platform, musicians. I'm going to pray for you all, but please don't move. I'm going to ask for just for a couple more minutes of your time. We're going to pray, and we're going to sing a song together. I want us to go out rejoicing today. But for now, still your hearts, every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's give a few moments to the Holy Spirit. Because I believe there are people in this place today whom the Lord is calling. You've never understood before that in order to be a real believer, you had to accept Christ in your life and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm going to pray a prayer which I want you to echo in your heart. Don't need to repeat it. I'm going to pray it, and I'm going to ask somebody to speak to you afterwards. But I'm looking for people who are responding to the Spirit today, saying, I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus. Here's the prayer. For the first time, pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to you now, and I confess 
that I'm a sinner and that I need you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for being raised for me. I put my trust in you and believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I confess you as Lord of my life. I receive this word of faith in my spirit. And I declare, Jesus is Lord of my life. Amen and amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you prayed that prayer, it meant something for you. It touched you and you need Christ today. I want you to lift your hand right where you're sitting. I'm going to pray for you before we move on. Up and down this building, upstairs, downstairs, anywhere under the sound of my voice. If you prayed that prayer, you need Christ in your life to be your Savior. Lift your hand strong. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. We're not watching. God is watching. I'm going to pray for you. Thank you. Is there somebody else? Lift your hand. Stewards, please make, uh, consolidators, please just check where these people's hands are lifted. Thank you. God bless you up there in the balcony, over the road in the coronet, anywhere now under the sound of my voice. Those on the internet, you can email in. Father, in Jesus' name, for these people who are surrendering to you, let your Holy Spirit take full control. Bring the seed of faith that brings the fruit of salvation in their lives. In Jesus' name. For all of us, Lord, we pray that the rhema faith word of God spoken to our hearts will take us not just into this week, but every day of our lives, that we might feed on the bread of life every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do in our lives what only you can do. Release the power of faith, God's word at work in our circumstances, family, marriages, home, health, every aspect, every dimension. Let God be God and let God be true to His Word. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen.